Well, let's pray as we prepare our hearts to receive God's word this morning. Father, we thank you that we get a chance to be here, that we've had a chance to worship you, to honor your name. And now as we turn our hearts to your word, we ask that you would speak to us by your spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. It's 4.30 and you get off work at 5. Your employer is not around because they trust you to do your job. You have a choice to make. You can start to wind down early and you can coast through that last half hour and your boss will probably never know it. Or you can grab one last file and get to work on another project and get prepared for tomorrow. Now it's 5.30, you just got home from work, but you suddenly remember you promised your spouse that you would pick up groceries on your way home. And again, you have a choice to make. You can get back in the car, you can go get it done, or you can walk in the door and offer an excuse and hopefully somebody can pick it up later. Now it's 8.30, it was a tense dinner that night because some of those items you were supposed to bring home were actually important to the meal, uh, were crucial to the dinner plans that night, so dinner was not great, the conversation was tense, both of you lost your cool a little bit, and the kids were upset. Now you're heading out to pick up the groceries that you were supposed to get earlier, and in the checkout line you see an old flame. Someone you had a crush on when you were in high school and they start to talk to you and they are being very friendly. And they ask for your number and they say, hey, maybe we can get together sometime and do coffee. You have a choice to make. Do I give my number knowing that this person really was just hitting on you and it's probably not gonna be an innocent conversation that they wanna have. It's 9.30 p.m., you get home from the grocery store. Your spouse is a little bit, still a little bit upset but they've calmed down a bit and you now have a few choices to make. Do you apologize for your part in what happened earlier? Do you tell them about the conversation at the grocery store? Do you tell them that you took this person's number and you want them to know that so that it can remain innocent and there can be accountability? Now it's 10 p.m., you're sitting at your computer looking at your finances and you can't get over the cost of groceries, the cost of gas, the cost of, of uh, just getting a copy, uh, coffee in the morning, the cost of your Starbucks coffee. Something has to change. Inflation has gone sky high and you have to cut something out. The kids' sports, no, you can't do that. Your, your night extra night out with friends every week, no, can't do that. The takeout meals that you get for lunch, uh, uh, every day, no, you can't do that. And then it hits you. You see how much you're giving to generous uh, causes. And you give to the church, and you give to ministry projects in the community. If you cut some of that, then maybe you could actually make this all work out. You could make your finances balance out without cutting your lifestyle. Do you stop those payments and pull out from some of your commitments toward generosity? Or do you continue to give and trust that the Lord will provide and find another place to cut? In just six hours, you have been faced with a series of small decisions that will either lead to blessing in your life or decisions that will lead to struggles in your life. And all of these little decisions boil down to something that the Bible calls faithfulness. There's a proverb in the Bible that says, love and faithfulness, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. And what the Bible is trying to tell us in this verse is that probably the most difficult thing that you can do and yet the most powerful thing that you can do over the course of your life is to make faithfulness your best friend. To make faithfulness something that is so close to you that it will never leave you. Faithfulness is probably in the top five of the most important character traits in the Bible. Faithfulness can save you from some of the worst mistakes that you will ever make in your life. Faithfulness can protect your character. Faithfulness can protect your reputation. Faithfulness can give you a brighter future. Faithfulness is the foundational glue that holds relationships together. So Proverbs says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. The hardest part about faithfulness is faithfulness is the what. It's not the why. And we're hardwired to need a why. And for that reason, it's interesting that this proverb pairs together love and faithfulness. Because love is the why and faithfulness is the what. Why be faithful and work hard for that last half hour at work? If you're gonna do that, you need a why. Why get those groceries even though you're tired from the end of the day? You need a why. Why turn down that phone number when you know it's not gonna be innocent? You need a why. 
And the why is love. Love for God, first of all, love for yourself, love for your spouse, love for your family. Faithfulness is the glue that holds all of our relationships together and love is the why. And I think that we all get that for most of us, particularly those of us who believe that there is a God and we love God and we desire to, that our life would please God and honor God. We all want to be faithful to God. But why is faithfulness so difficult? Why is it so hard? Well, if we're being completely honest, part of it is because faithfulness is boring. Faithfulness is the small decisions that we make every single day over the course of our life that add up to the kind of life that we really want. And some days that is really boring. Those decisions to be faithful are boring. Work hard that final half hour. Go back to the grocery store and get those items. Turn down that phone number and go home and have that tough conversation. Giving generously. Those are boring decisions. Faithfulness is also tough work. You know, you think about the things that you value in life. What is the role of the things of faithfulness and the things that you value in life? You might not have thought about this before, but faithfulness is at the core of almost anything that you appreciate in your life. Think about something you value. Uh, any, any football fans here? Anybody watching, you know, NFL football leading up to the Super Bowl? There's a couple of games uh, going on today. Any hockey fans here? Right, hockey fans, and I'm assuming there's some. What's your favorite team, Oilers? Any Oilers fans here? Uh, Maple Leafs fans? Canucks? Canuck fans here? Uh, the Habs? The Flames? All right, okay. When was the last time your team won the cup? Sorry to rub that in. Uh, when was the last time your team won the cup? I know that question hurts. But when a team wins a championship... And when a team succeeds at the highest level, think of the role that faithfulness played in that championship. In order to win at the highest level, you have to be faithful. These guys have been working hard behind the scenes all of their lives. Individually, everyone on a championship team has to be faithful. Faithful to themselves, faithful to their training, faithful to their goals. They have left behind all kinds of other opportunities or all kinds of other things that they could have done with their life to pursue this dream of athletic excellence and winning a championship. As a team, everyone on the team has to be faithful to each other and to the coaching staff. Many teams have great rosters and they have great players on their team, but the teams that win championships are not the teams that are playing for themselves, they're playing for each other. And, and they're faithful to each other. The coaches, the management, the players, they all have to buy in and be faithful to their training and faithful to executing their game plan. Faithful to eat the right meals, faithful to get to bed on time the night before, faithful to do all the right things in order to give themselves a chance to win. So think about something that you value, that book, that movie that you just love. What is the role of faithfulness in that project? Think about a product that you have purchased that you just love and you would buy it again. There's a faithfulness that is at work behind the scenes in the development process, in the manufacturing process. Everyone is working together to be faithful, to learn their skill and do their part and get that product to market and make it the best possible product it can be. Think about the relationships that you value. That married couple that you look up to as an example for your own relationship. That friend that has never let you down, that person who is always there for you just when you need them the most, whatever it is, if there's something in your life that you value, whether it's a team or a product or a relationship, faithfulness is the glue that made that happen. All of those things come as a result of hard work. And sometimes we ask ourselves, what if I fail? Sometimes we say, you know, well, I, I screwed it up anyway last time, so why bother? What if I blow it? One of the barriers to us even trying to be faithful is that maybe we have failed in the past and we are genuinely afraid that we're going to fail again. And we tell ourselves, you know, I tried to be faithful, but I messed up. There, there's, there's many people these days that are on their second marriage. 
And either you were faithful in your first marriage and your spouse was not, or the other way around, or it just didn't work out for whatever reason, and you found love again, and you are making it work with a new partner, and there's stepkids, and this unique blended family situation, and it can be easy if things get tough to start to say, well, here it goes again, it's happening all over again, so why bother being faithful? And I just want to encourage you, keep going. Whatever your situation is, keep on being faithful. Have the tough conversations. Forgive what needs to be forgiven. Stick together and keep going. Be faithful. Don't let your past failures rob you of the life that God has for you right now. And sometimes we struggle with faithfulness because the payoff is just too far away. The payoff in marriage is that season when the kids are raised and you get to look back and you have blown it, yes, but you've also forgiven each other and pulled yourselves together and by the grace of God, you're still here looking at each other and you get to look back and say, we made it. Or one spouse is gone, but you get to look back and say, I was faithful. I did my best and I can't wait to see them again one day. That's the payoff. But for so many of, uh, of the areas of life where we can be faithful, you actually don't see immediate results of your faithfulness. You only see the results if you stop being faithful. Then the results show up real quick. But faithfulness in most areas, the payoff is not obvious. The payoff is further down the road. Um, we've been looking at this question, how do I live a life that honors God in a mixed up world? We looked at four things that are crucial to us. Uh, One of the four things that I chose in developing this series was faithfulness because faithfulness is the glue that holds relationships together and faithfulness is the glue that holds societies together. And I wonder sometimes if it can be easy to feel like giving up. So why should we be faithful? Nobody else is faithful. Nobody else is following God. Nobody else is being faithful at work. And we ask ourselves, why should I be the one to remain faithful? Well, in the time we have left, I want to offer you some thoughts from Scripture about faithfulness. First of all, be faithful because God is faithful. A long time ago, when God created the heavens and the earth, God had this design in mind for how human beings were going to live. God had uh, an intent for the kind of lives that we would have as his creatures on this planet and the kind of potential that he had created within us. But something went wrong. And rather than desiring to live life the way God wanted us to live, human beings chose to use their free will to rebel against God and sin entered the world. And from that moment, the world has been a mixed up place. We, we tend to think, okay, we live in a mixed up world and what's gone wrong with the world? Well, the world has always been a mixed up place since sin entered it. Sin entered the world through the choice of Adam and Eve, the choice that they made to rebel against God. And sin started to make a mess out of God's good creation. And God had a choice to make. He could destroy the earth and start over again, or he could be faithful to his creation. And God could faithfully start to work in our lives to help us to navigate in this new world that was now messed up by the power of sin. And throughout the generations that followed, the problem with sin only grew worse. But still, God chose to remain faithful to all the human beings that he created. God chose faithfulness as the way of responding in a mixed up world. God chose to take all the wrongs that were happening in the world. God chose to take all the harm that was happening in the world. God chose to use that wrong and that harm and turn it for good. And faithfulness has been God's response all the way through human history. For those who choose to trust in God, to those who are called according to his purpose, God turns everything evil for good in their lives. And countless times throughout the Bible, we're told that God is faithful. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, right at the end of the book, Paul is talking about God's faithfulness amidst all of the evil that's happening in the world. And Paul says, even though there's all of this messed up stuff, God is still able to sanctify you. God is still able to give you peace and sanctify you through and through. And God is going to make the church blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus. This is what Paul says just before the verse we're going to read. Paul says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then Paul says, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. 
So people are asking, well, how do we make it in this mixed up world? How do we survive? How do we last? And Paul says, God will not let you down. God is not going to give up on you. All of the evil that you see happening around you, God is working all of this out for good in your life. Just hold on to him. Just trust in him. God is going to give you peace. He's the God of peace. He's going to give you peace. God is going to sanctify you, meaning that all of the struggles that you are going through, all of the times that you feel like you just can't make it and you messed up, uh, you get messed up by things that are happening around you, Paul says, God is able to sanctify you through that. God is able to keep you clean from all of that and God is going to help you and God will be faithful to you. The other problem that we have in addition to the problem of sin is that human beings have an enemy who opposes them. And the Bible calls him the devil or Satan or the evil one. And Paul says that the evil one is at work making faithfulness difficult for people who desire to follow God. Paul says just before the verse that we're going to read in a moment, Paul says, pray for us because there's, there's all kinds of wicked and evil people that are opposing us and, and trying to harm us because not everyone is a believer. Not everybody really wants to see God stuff happen in the world. And then Paul says, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Now the evil one that he's talking about here is the devil or Satan. Satan was with Adam and Eve in the garden, tempting them to rebel against God. And he is still around today, tempting us. And I think that this is important for us to acknowledge. We don't talk about Satan very often, but ultimately we believe that Satan is a, a defeated enemy. He doesn't have any power over Christians. But one thing he still is able to do is lie to us and try to discourage us from faithfulness. Satan loves to discourage people. He loves to oppose what God is doing in the world. And I think it's fair to say, when you think about the scenarios that I described earlier and the different decisions that we can make on a daily basis to be either faithful to God or not be faithful, I think it's fair to say that some of those temptations come from within us. Some of the temptations we face come from the desires that are in us. They come from our own tiredness. They come from our own flesh. But some of the temptations that we face come from the enemy of our souls. And the reality is that in the spiritual realm, there's an evil one, and he has been opposing God's plan from the very beginning, and he still exists trying to oppose God's plan in your life. But Paul says he is real. The enemy is real. But remember that God is faithful and God will strengthen you and God will protect you from the evil one. And I believe we need to remember the evil one when we are tempted in the area of faithfulness because what happens is sometimes a temptation comes to us just out of the blue and we wonder, well, where did that thought come from? That thought is just gross. Where did that come from? And we kind of feel dirty because we've experienced this temptation. But we need to remember that temptation is not sin. Just because an idea comes to your mind, that idea uh, doesn't mean that that idea came from you. And it doesn't mean that you have to act on it. When our temptation comes our way, Paul says, remember, God is faithful. God will strengthen you and God can protect, protect you. So when temptation comes, all we need to do is call out to God, speak Jesus' name. Hey, Jesus, this is what my mind is telling me to do. This is what my body is telling me to do. But Jesus, help me to be faithful. I need you to strengthen me right now. I need you to enter the room right now. I need you to enter my truck right now. I need you to enter this conversation that I'm having right now and strengthen me and protect me from the evil one. There's a great verse in Hebrews 10, 23. It says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful. In other words, in those moments when we want to be faithful and whether because of sin within us or because of the evil one tempting us, we are struggling to make the right decision. Paul says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess because God has given us a promise and in Christ that promise is yes. And God who promised is faithful. So the first reason to be faithful is because God is faithful. Second reason is faithfulness gets God's attention. This is an important biblical principle, and there's a few verses in the Bible that talk about the idea that God is looking for people, that God's eyes are scanning the earth, and God is always looking for faithful person, people. And these verses imply that there's something about faithfulness that gets God's attention. 
Here's one of those verses. This one is from 1 Chronicles 16. And in the context of this verse, there's a king named Asa. And in the past, King Asa has walked by faith when he has faced trouble. He's always chosen to put his trust in God. He's always chosen to walk by faith. But this time, he has made a treaty with another king. And rather than trusting God, uh, he's made this treaty of protection with another king. So a prophet comes to King Asa and says this. He says, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And then he says, what a fool you've been. From now on, you will be at war. So King Asa has been walking by faith and trusting that God is gonna save him. But now King Asa has entered into a treaty with a foreign king to be his protector. And God says, now you'll be at war. If you had just trusted me, if you just kept walking by faith, I would have given you peace, but now you'll be at war. And this is a great example of what I was talking about earlier. The problem with faithfulness is that the results of faithfulness often show up only when you stop being faithful. Asa had been faithful to God. He had trusted God for his whole life up to that point in time, but for some reason he got discouraged, he lost faith, and rather than continuing to walk by faith in God, Asa stopped trusting God. He makes a treaty with a foreign king to protect him rather than continuing to trust God. And then Asa sees too late the result of his, of his faithfulness was that God had been protecting him. But now he decided to stop trusting God and he was going to receive the results of his unfaithfulness. This is what make, makes faithfulness so difficult. Faithfulness really is like the word implies. It's a walk of faith. It really is a walk of faith on our part. Let me show you another example of this in the area of money and resources that God gives to us. There's a story in Malachi chapter three. And what happened was people had stopped giving resources to the work of God. And so the temple had to close up and the priests were starving and people's spiritual lives were suffering. And as as a result of the lack of resources coming into the temple, When people were faithful to give, they didn't notice the results of their faithfulness, but God was being faithful in return. They just didn't notice it. Then when people stopped being faithful in their generosity towards God and they stopped giving, giving, then famine hit the land and the resources that they had taken for granted suddenly dried up and they saw the results of their unfaithfulness. And God sent the prophet Malachi into this situation and Malachi says, God says, return to me. And the people are like, well, what does God mean by that? We never left. We didn't go anywhere. What what does God mean, return to me? How can we return if we never went away? And they're confused. And they thought that everything was fine because they had grown used to having all of these problems in their life. And Malachi says, well, God says you've been cheating him. And they said, well, how have we been cheating God? And God says, you've been cheating me of tithes and offerings due to me. And then in verse 10, Malachi says this, he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. And he goes on to say, your crops will be abundant for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe. Then all the nations will be blessed for your land will be such a delight. So again, we see this principle at work that faithfulness gets God's attention. And in this example, faithfulness with money, faithfulness with the resources that God has given you, tithing is one of those things that's difficult to measure. You know, my wife and I went through a rough season and one of the choices that we made during that season was to stop giving. And this actually made things far worse for us. It actually was very hard for us financially. It looked like cutting our giving was the right solution, but I didn't realize just how much our generosity was actually protecting us financially. And when I cut our giving, weird stuff started to happen. Suddenly our vehicles had random issues. Our furnace started to leak water out of the humidifier and it ended up costing me what it would have cost if I had kept giving. It was almost like God was saying, you know, there's a certain amount of resources which I have provided you with that belongs to me. You get to keep most of it, but there's a certain amount that belongs to me. And I'm not gonna let you keep that 
regardless of what you do. So then we started giving again. We started off slowly because we were in a bit of trouble. We started giving 3%. For a while we did that, then we started giving 5%, and then we started giving 7%, and then we started giving 10%. And the problems went away. The van that I drive, I haven't put more than oil and gasoline in that thing for years. And it's like a tank. It just keeps going. And I can't explain it. I can't give you a reason why that thing starts in the morning and why it just keeps driving. Except that we give faithfully to the kingdom of God. And God responds by protecting our finances. It's almost like, okay, with giving, we can choose to be a cesspool or we can choose to be a river. A cesspool is basically a body of water where fresh water flows into it when the rains come, but nothing flows out of it. But a river, fresh water flows in and fresh water flows out. And what I've discovered over the years about giving is that when I keep the river flowing, when I pour out as God is pouring into me, then God is invested in blessing me because he sees, hey, this is not a stagnant cesspool. There's some outflow here. And God becomes invested in protecting and guarding your finances because there's an outflow of generosity that's coming out of you into the kingdom of God. Now that's one example. There's other examples about money, other examples about other areas of faithfulness. But the bottom line is this. For some reason, God has chosen that faithfulness is the foundational key that leads to a better life for you in the future. Even though faithfulness is boring, even though faithfulness is hard work, even though we are unfaithful sometimes and we just want to give up and not bother trying again, even though we get discouraged because the payoff just seems so far away, faithfulness is a category that's near and dear to God's heart and your future self benefits from your present faithfulness. When you are faithful to your family, your future self benefits from that. When you are faithful to your work habits, your future self benefits from that. When you are faithful in your financial habits, your future self benefits from that. Faithfulness just works. We can't fully explain it, it just works. Faithfulness is not perfection, but faithfulness is persisting through failure. I wanna share a verse with you. You need to mark this verse down, especially when we're talking about faithfulness because what's happening right now is there's probably a certain amount of conviction in the room. And as we're talking about faithfulness, most of us are thinking about the areas where we have, we're not thinking about the areas where we've been faithful, we're thinking about the areas where we have not been faithful, where we have blown it. And there's probably people in the room right now wondering, okay, well, what about me? I've made mistake after mistake over the course of my life. What does God think about me? I haven't been perfect. I wish I could go back in time and make decisions differently, but I have blown it. I've made many mistakes over the course of my life. So far, I haven't always been faithful. Does that mean that God doesn't love me anymore? Where do I stand with God? If that's you, I want you to mark this verse down. Highlight it in your physical Bible. Highlight it in your digital Bible. This verse is very important. It's from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 to 13. Here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. Okay, so this is talking about Jesus and Jesus calls us to die to ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. So it's talking about that. If we died with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we hold on to faith, we will reign with him. One day we will see Jesus and live with him and spend an eternity with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. Okay, so this is, think about the areas of your life where you've struggled with being faithful. Did you ever disown God? No. You struggled, you made mistakes, you wandered, you were trying to figure it out, but if we disown Jesus, he will disown us. That's what this scripture is saying, regardless of whether or not it fits with your theology or not, that's what the verse says. If we disown him, he will disown us, but most people don't disown God, we just blow it. We are faithless. We want to do what's right, but we're faithless sometimes. Then look at this next part. But if we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot disown himself. So if we put our faith and our trust in Christ, even in those times when we are faithless, God remains faithful to us for he cannot disown himself. Faithfulness is not about perfection. 
As you are learning to follow Jesus, you won't always get everything right, and that is okay. Faithfulness is not about perfection. Faithfulness is about persisting through your failures. And if we endure through failure, we will reign with him. Now I wanna bring us back to where we started. The idea that faithfulness is a long obedience in the same direction. This is what Proverbs, uh, the proverb that we started with said, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Um, uh, write them on the tablet of your heart. The way that faithfulness works, you will not necessarily see the visible results of your faithfulness. The only time you will see visible results is when you stop being faithful. That seems to be the principle of faithfulness. Faithfulness is obeying God by faith and walking by faith even when it's hard, even when it's difficult. Faithfulness is working till five because it's the right thing to do and trusting that that extra half hour will add up over time and benefit you in ways that you can't fully see. Faithfulness is getting back in the car and going to get those groceries to fulfill that obligation that you made to your spouse. Faithfulness is believing that the decision to do that will compound over time and will benefit your character and build trust with the people that you love. Faithfulness is saying a polite no to that person who wants your number when you know well and good that they are flirting with you. Faithfulness is finding a way to keep generosity flowing into the kingdom of God, even if it means that you cut one of your streaming services for a while or you take uh, lunch to work instead of buying lunch while you're at work or you make your coffee at home instead of going to 10 bucks, I mean Starbucks. Um, <laughs> And then trusting that as you give to God's kingdom, that God is now invested in you because you are a river that he can give into. And he knows that the blessing he gives to you will flow out of you and into his kingdom on earth. Faithfulness is those kind of actions, boring actions, hard work sometimes. And faithfulness is if you blow it, you get back up and you keep on going and you keep on walking by faith. That's the essence of faithfulness. Just as we close today, I wanna to give just a few ideas, a few practical ideas of how you can become faithful. You, you have a desire to be faithful, desire to be faithful to God, where do you start? Just wanna offer you a few suggestions. First thing to think about is you wanna aim at the right target. The worst thing you can do in trying to be faithful is heading off in the wrong direction and then at the end of it saying, oh, you know, I was faithful, but you, know, you ended up way over here. So you wanna aim at the right target. The domains of faithfulness, the things that God cares about, the categories of things that God cares about are things like your household, your workplace, your community, and his kingdom. God cares about your household and how things are going for you and your family. God cares about your workplace and your vocation and your calling and your business and all of those things. God cares about that. God cares about your neighbors and, and your life in your neighborhood, your life in your community. God cares about his kingdom on earth and he desires to build up his kingdom on earth. So those are the things you wanna aim for. And so maybe you wanna sit down and say, what about my workplace? What about my household? What about my community? How, how can I be faithful as a, as a father, as a mother in my household? How can I be faithful in my workplace? Maybe I can show up 10 minutes early instead of just showing up on time. Maybe I can work until my time, my shift is actually done and then pack up things and leave and, and just learn to be faithful to the entire work of the day and work of the job. What does faithfulness look like in my neighborhood and how can I be faithful to my neighbors and, and be a blessing to my neighbors? What does faithfulness look like in the kingdom of God? You know, am I, am, am I serving in the kingdom? Am I uh, giving to the kingdom? Uh, am I using my talents for the kingdom, my skills and abilities for God's kingdom? So you wanna aim at the right target. Second thing is you wanna keep the end in mind. Keep the end in mind. Proverbs 3, 4, it's the verse that comes right after the verse we've been looking at. Let, 
Let love and faithfulness love never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. And then it says, then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. And that's the end. That's the goal. There's going to be this moment where we're going to meet God. And there's going to be this moment at the end of our life when we're going to look back on our life and, and, and we're going to ask ourselves, uh, you know, did I contribute to the lives of people around me? So start to think about that. What do you want to contribute toward other people in your life? What do you want to contribute as a father or a mother to your kids, as a stepfather, as a stepmother to your stepchildren? What do you want to contribute to their lives? What do you want to contribute to the lives of your coworkers or the lives of the people who work for you? What do you want to contribute to your neighborhood and your community? What do you want to bring to God at the end of your life? You know, when we show up at the end of our life, if we have done nothing to pour into the kingdom, then we have nothing to bring. But if we have served, if we have used our talents, if we have used our skills and abilities, if we have given to support God's kingdom work, then we have something to bring to God at the end of our life and say, God, this was was my aim. It was to be faithful to you And here's what I have to offer. This is what I've done. Now that's not gonna save you. We know that it's Jesus that saves us, but but we wanna have something to offer God at the end of our life. Finally, rely on the power of God's spirit. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what's common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're attempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. What an amazing promise. We have this promise as we're kind of tempted to stop being faithful. We have this promise that God is faithful and he won't let us be tempted what, beyond what we can endure. And that we can just keep going and keep walking by faith and keep trusting. Father God, we thank you for your love and your care for us. We thank you for this word about faithfulness. Faithfulness is something that's hard for us to really quantify. It's hard for us to comprehend and understand because it just works. And as we are faithful, it's easy to wonder, is this making a difference? Does this really matter? Is this really important? And it's only when we stop being faithful that we see and we learn that it really was. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to walk by faith and continue to be faithful. And Lord, if there's any areas of our life where you want to shore up or sharpen up our faithfulness, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts and minds and teach us what it is that you want us to know. We thank you, Lord God, that when we're faithless, you are always faithful. In the areas where we have been faithless in our past, you have always been faithful to us. And God, we don't deserve that, but we say thank you and we bless you for it and we love you for it. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be incredibly gracious to you and give you his perfect peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and all God's people shout it out. Amen, amen. Have a fantastic day. Be blessed. We'll see you again here next Sunday.